you. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Banerjee and Dr. Berlakis for the invitation to be a part. What they've asked me to do is present, as he said, sort of a case-based uh, discussion. So when Dr. Berlakis called me a few months ago and asked me to do this, I thought, oh my, I'm going to need to be on the lookout for some interesting uh, cases that have to do with antiplatelet, maybe dilemmas, difficult decision making. And within a week, I had about a dozen cases that I did not have the answers to. So uh, I think you'll find the same thing that as we present some of these uh, cases, you will think of patients and some of the questions that you've come across as well. I have no financial disclosures. So I've really got three scenarios that I'm going to present. And then off of that, I'm going to present a little bit of data. And I'm not going to give you all the answers. We don't have all the answers. But I hope that it is the beginning of some thought process discussions. And uh, as he said, as the, as the years goes by, I know we will get more and more answers. So the first patient was a lady that I took care of in the cath lab in the ICU. She was a 65-year-old lady who presented really with an inferior ST elevation MI and was going to be transferred to our center. Now, in route, as sometimes happens with inferior STEMI, she began to develop heart block, bradycardia, and so the EMS crew uh, began to do transcutaneous pacing. And as you've had experience with that, you know that's not always very effective, not always very comfortable. And so they kept giving her more and more and more sedation to the point where they eventually uh, shut off her respiratory drive and she uh, had to be intubated. So when she arrives at our center, uh, we knew the diagnosis ahead of time, so she was directly transferred to our cath lab. Uh, she was found to have um, non-critical disease in her circ. I'm sorry, in her LAD and right, but the dominant vessel was the circumflex, and that was the uh, culprit vessel. So here's a picture of the ECG. You'll recognize predominantly a posterior pattern, and the arrows there show you the second-degree heart block, and then here is the coronary anatomy. So. She arrives, she's given aspirin by a rectal route. She had received a single bolus of unfractionated heparin. That's sort of our norm uh, for STEMI patients. She was intubated, so we didn't really have access to her GI tract for antiplatelet medicine. So the, the question was, how are we going to treat this person? What kind of antiplatelet medicines uh, will we use? And that decision really is tied in, in my mind, as to what type of anticoagulants we will also use. So the choices that really came to my mind, we don't use a lot of enoxaparin, although that wouldn't be unreasonable. Uh, the choices that really came to my mind was where we're going to use an unfractionated heparin-based protocol in which we could certainly use what had been the standard for many, many years, which was a 2B3A antagonist. That would be a reasonable approach. Our center, however, again, sort of prefers bivalirudin in these uh, patients, as I'll show you and remind you a little bit of the data. And that sort of instructs how we will use 2B3A or antiplatelet medications. Uh, as you recall, the studies that use bivalirudin, it seems that some of the benefit is related to reduced bleeding, and that seems to be related to reduced use of 2B3A antagonists. So a lot of different options. Uh, in my mind, uh, I was going to use bivalirudin, and so we had these options, as you see there. I could use one of the newer agents uh, as soon as we got an NG tube down. Uh, you could consider a 2B3A antagonist, whether that be an IV or an IC route intracoronary. And then, although it's not available, I just want to at least make you aware of a new medication that may be available soon called Cangrelor. Uh, whoa, that's not where I meant to be. Okay, that's the end. <laughs> okay. So how do we manage patients, antiplatelets, anticoagulant therapy, in patients who cannot take anything uh, by mouth, either GI tract doesn't work or it's not available to you? Well, as I said, we were going to use bivalirudin. That's based upon this trial, which is now a fairly old trial called the Horizons AMI trial. I suspect you're well familiar with that, and I'm not going to review all of that, but just a couple of things I want to uh, remind you about that. One of the things that was a surprise when that study was presented was not only was it equivalent to the, the standard at that time, which was heparin and 2B3A antagonist, but we actually saw a improvement in mortality both at 30 days and one year, and that was really a surprise finding, and it really was the beginning of us beginning to ask the questions, hey, this bleeding issue may be more than a nuisance. This bleeding issue may be related to very important clinical events, and I think that trial led to more investigations. However, the other thing, I guess the Achilles heel of bivalirudin was this, that there was an early increased rate of stent thrombosis in those patients who were administered uh, bivalirudin, and certainly in patients in whom uh, 
we have limited options with antiplatelet agents, that is something to consider. So uh, just recently, I thought this was appropriate to share with you. This was presented at TCT just a couple of months ago, almost a recapitulation of the HORIZONS trial. Again, studying by Valerudin in patients, high-risk patients with ST elevation MI. This was a European-based study. Again, very similar, although it kind of brings it into the modern era, i.e. half the patients use the newer uh, thionylpyridines, prasugrel and ticagrelor. Uh, about half the patients use radial intervention uh, as opposed to femoral. And so we wanted to see what the results would be. And for the most part, I think the top-line results look fairly similar, with the notable differences being that as opposed to horizons, we did not see a reduction in mortality with bivalirudin in this study. And that's a little bit surprising, uh, perhaps, uh, given that we were using more potent antiplatelet agents. And the other thing which is disappointing to me, at least, is that we still saw statistically higher early stent thrombosis rates. I think for many years we have felt like, well, with bivalirudin, one of the problems was we were using clopidogrel. We know clopidogrel's onset is fairly slow. And so with the newer agents, more rapid agents, perhaps we will be able to get rid of that early stent thrombosis. But at least based on the data we have so far, uh, that was not the case. The other agent, which like I said, is not yet FDA approved in this country, but uh, many of us expect that it will be approved, perhaps even this year, is an agent called Cangrelor. And Cangrelor is uh, structurally similar to Ticagrelor. In other words, it's a PTY12 receptor antagonist, so it works in the same uh, mechanism on the platelets, very rapid onset. It's an IV agent only. It has a very rapid onset and a very rapid offset. So some of the concerns we have when we poison our patients' platelets with these drugs, and then lo and behold, they may need surgery or they start to bleed. Uh, those concerns are always there, and Kangalore might be an answer. Whoops, I did it again. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, and so the results of the, uh, the most recent trial, the Champion Phoenix trial, compared the use of Kangrelor to Clopidogrel, which was sort of the standard at the time, it does show, similar to what we've seen with Prasugrel and Ticagrelor, some benefit, about 20% reduction in ischemic endpoints and about a 50, 40 to 50% reduction in stent thrombosis. So a little more potent agent, probably going to be associated with a little bit higher bleeding rates. Uh, but again, for people who can't take anything by mouth or their uh, gut doesn't work, this could be a great option in the future. Well, the second aspect of this case, uh, it only gets more complex. Uh, so we finished the case, unremarkable. Uh, we put in an NG tube, and lo and behold, she begins to have significant bleeding uh, through her nose. She drops her hemoglobin almost four grams. And so we're now sort of reeling, trying to figure out how to back off some of the anticoagulant agents. And then on top of that, she develops paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So now we're in this realm. We've talked about it with TAVR patients and other patients who may need anticoagulation, but then we also feel that they need some sort of antiplatelet agents. How do we deal with all of these agents that they might uh, need? Well, there's a couple options. We don't have an audience response system, but I suspect your options would be the same. Sometimes we just sort of absentmindedly ignore it. Oh, I forgot all about that atrial fibrillation ignore it and just use the antiplatelet agents. Uh, sometimes we'll take this tack, a little higher road. Um, we'll just say, well, that atrial fib was caused by the EMI. Clearly their risk of recurrent atrial fib is low and it's just another fancy way of ignoring it. But for those patients whom, whom we say, no, we really need to uh, administer anticoagulations, uh, there are a lot of questions that that, that brings up. You know, do we use Coumadin? Do we use the newer agents? If we use Coumadin, what level of INR? Do we adjust it? Uh, do we use the newer PTY12 receptor antagonist, or do we just use Plavix? Lots of different things that we can do. Uh, of late, some folks have been interested in using just a single antiplatelet agent with warfarin. So lots of choices here, and I'll show you a little bit about what we know about that. First of all, you are between a rock and a hard place when this happens because on one hand, we know that their risk of bleeding is enhanced and bleeding is really not good. Bleeding has been associated very strongly uh, for a decade or more. We've known this with mortality, MI, stroke, stent thrombosis. On the other hand, 
the use of triple therapy, warfarin and dual antiplatelet therapy, is clearly associated with increased bleeding. But if we simply ignore that and we use uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and we figure that may be enough for the atrial fibrillation, we really know, based on good scientific studies, that that is, in fact, not enough. And so this is the active W study looking at patients with atrial fibrillation, and they tried dual antiplatelet therapy versus warfarin or oral anticoagulation therapy, and the study was actually stopped early uh, because of about 40% higher rate of thromboembolic events with dual antiplatelet therapy. So into this clinical question, we really haven't had a lot of good data until recently. We've had registry studies like you see here, and on the left-hand side, you see various permutation of medications that we can use. On the left-hand side, is we're looking at ischemic events, and you can see that the, the regimens that produce the lowest ischemic events are not surprisingly those that are the most robust, triple therapy, or at least warfarin and clopidogrel. On the right-hand side, we see the risk of bleeding, and of course, the less you're on, the lower your risk of bleeding. And on the other hand, triple therapy would give you the highest risk of bleeding. So from this study, at least it brings up the idea of perhaps warfarin with a single antiplatelet agent, whether that's aspirin or clopidogrel or something else like that, could be a nice middle ground in that regard. And it's really into that clinical dilemma that the WOS trial uh, helped spill somewhat of a void uh, which was published this last year. So the WOS trial uh, run out of Europe looks at patients who are in need of anticoagulation. Most of these were atrial fibrillation patients, uh, but they were PCI patients as well, and so they had a need for dual antiplatelet therapy. So all the patients got warfarin, and then they randomized them to either get dual antiplatelet therapy or single antiplatelet agent. So what did we find? Well, on the left-hand side, which was the primary endpoint, not surprisingly, we saw a pretty dramatic reduction in bleeding events if we only had two agents as opposed to three agents. Now, the, the, the effect here looks pretty dramatic. They had a very liberal definition of bleeding, but nonetheless, we're not surprised to find that you're going to have less bleeding in, if you have two agents versus three. However, what we find on the right-hand side of the graph there was, I think, uh, a little bit surprising to me, but it's very uh, satisfying, and that is that those who were only on two drugs, not only did they have less bleeding, but there did not appear to be a price to be paid in terms of ischemic events. In fact, if anything, it appears they may even have lower ischemic events uh, with two drugs rather than three drugs. And so based upon this, many people have begun to adopt this strategy for patients with, say, atrial fib or some other reason for anticoagulation to just add on a single antiplatelet drug. In this case, it was clopidogrel. Um, we don't have therapy on, uh, we don't have data on whether aspirin would be just as effective or what, but I think that is uh, a way that we're going to see moving forward in the future. There are still questions to be answered for sure. That study was significantly underpowered to study stent thrombosis issues, but at least in a broad sense of ischemic events, it seems to be uh, helpful. Uh, again, there's, there's a lot of other questions. You know, we have many newer anticoagulants. We have these newer antiplatelet agents many permutations that we can think of from that Pioneer trial, among others, will look at multiple uh, permutations of this, and in the coming years, we're going to have more information. Okay, so my last scenario that I want to present, really a very complex thing. I thought this merry-go-round was an appropriate picture. This was a 53-year-old man who I, we have seen at our center on two occasions. Now, I was taking care of him again a couple of months ago when he presented with an anterior ST elevation in mind, but let me give you a little history on him. We had seen him once before about two years ago when he presented with an inferior STEMI. And at that time, his story was that he had gotten a stent actually in the VA hospital in Houston. Uh, he had not been compliant with his clopidogrel therapy. He came up to our institution a week later. He had a STEMI. Okay, we don't see him again. Uh, this time he wanders down to the San Antonio VA, and he gets bifurcation stenting done down there. They probably didn't know his whole story and scenario. And uh, then he wanders back up to our place, this time with a second stent thrombosis event, this time of his anterior uh, wall. So we don't really know who the VA physician in San Antonio was, but I'll just say that Dr. Berlakis has been cited in San Antonio fairly recently. So draw your own conclusions. Okay, here's this picture of the uh, LAD. Um, so my partner was actually taking care of him in the ICU. I'm not exactly sure why he did this, but he decided to go ahead. The, the, the patient 
claimed that he had been compliant with his clopidogrel this time. Uh, my partner went ahead and reloaded him with clopidogrel with some doubt of whether that was really true or not. And after reloading him, um, he did platelet function testing and found his uh, verify now to be 240 platelet reactive units. And I'll just tell you that that still seems to be in an ineffective range. So despite the fact that he was swallowing uh, clopidogrel, it was not having the desired effect on his platelets. So a lot of clinical questions that we can ask out of this. You know, risk factors for stent thrombosis, how does the drug, how does the patient, how does the scenario all interplay? The role of individualized therapy, there's been a lot of questions about whether we should be using platelet monitoring. And I suspect a lot of you have that in your hospital and you're probably like us struggling to understand how to use that. And then the question Dr. Berlach has brought up recently about what is the length of dual antiplatelet therapy, particularly in a patient like this who's already shown us a predilection for uh, stent thrombosis. So there are multiple risk factors for stent thrombosis. I think most of you will be familiar with this list. Always at the top of the list is this issue of lack of adequate dual antiplatelet therapy. And we may broaden that to say not only is it a lack of them taking it, it could be a compliance issue, but we now know that in some people it's not a compliance issue, but it's an effectiveness issue, perhaps genetically or drug-drug interactions. All of that can be lumped into that issue. But it's a very important issue in terms of controlling stent thrombosis. What about the various drugs that we use? I think we all are familiar and comfortable with clopidogrel, and you probably are aware of some of the shortcomings of clopidogrel. On the other hand, uh, with apologies to the companies who probably don't like me putting those two drugs in the same box, but nonetheless, I'm going to lump prasugrel and ticagrelor together as they share many of the common qualities. That is, we know they have a much more rapid onset of action, higher levels of platelet inhibition. They appear to have less inter-individual variability, as we've seen with clopidogrel, and at least in most clinical scenarios, seem to have better, better clinical outcomes. Uh, this illustrates the pivotal trials that led to the approval of Prasugrel and Ticagrelor, both predominantly in ACS-type patients and really fairly similar results compared to Clopidogrel with about a 15 to 20 percent reduction in ischemic events with some increased risk of bleeding associated with that. I'm going to skip through that. So this is where we're at every day as clinicians, trying to balance, on one hand, the risk of bleeding that occurs if we're too aggressive or we use too potent of agents, whereas on the other hand, having risk of stent thrombosis and other adverse ischemic events. And we're always uh, trying to balance that. Uh, another concept that I just want to present to you briefly is this that's gotten a lot of press recently called high on treatment treatment platelet reactivity. The concept here is that they're taking the medications, but they still don't appear to be effective. In other words, their platelets are still uh, aggregating, they're still activated despite being on um, medications that should alter that. Now, this is a very complex field, and I think for the average clinician, uh, these issues of functional assays and genotyping and phenotyping, I'm not going to get into a lot of that. If you're not a full-time platelotologist, that stuff is very esoteric. But there are some very practical applications of this. And at the bottom there, I think one of the things, the take-home keys to, to remember is that this idea, this high on-treatment platelet reactivity, particularly in the setting of ACS, is associated with adverse events that we would like to avoid. Mortality, non-fatal MI, stent thrombosis. In fact, it appears that this high on-treatment platelet reactivity probably explains the majority of early stent thrombosis. Nonetheless, we can't really think of it as a diagnosis, but it is simply one of multiple risk factors that we have to manage and we have to balance as we think about the patients. And in this slide, I like this slide I borrowed from one of my colleagues that reminds us that this whole idea of stent thrombosis, how do you get there? Well, it may be a patient issue. It may be a stent, as Dr. Berlach has talked about. Stent design is moving in a direction that I think will be less thrombogenic, but certainly that's been an issue in the past. There are technical issues. We as interventional cardiologists must do excellent work and implant the stents correctly and optimally, and then there are lesion characteristics. So all of these things uh, play a role. On the other hand, high on-treatment platelet reactivity, if we simply look for that and measure that in all of our patients, we may be over-treating patients because it doesn't seem to be as significant of a risk factor in low-risk patients, i.e. those who do not have ACS. And a good example of that 
is the Trilogy ACS study, which looked at Prasegrel versus Plavix in lower risk ACS patients, although their measurements of platelet reactivity did go down, were improved with Prasegrel, as you would expect, it didn't translate into obvious clinical benefits, again, probably because of the overall uh, risk profile of the patient. So can we use this issue, can we use platelet assessment testing to guide our therapy? It's so logical that many of us have already jumped to do that in certain cases, but unfortunately the data so far has been a bit disappointing. And Gravitas, Trigger, PCI, both trials that looked at patients, measured their platelet reactivity, and then tried to adjust therapy based upon that. And they've all given us disappointing uh, results to date. There are reasons why that may be, maybe the wrong patient selection, maybe we didn't have uh, effective enough therapies to uh, cause a, a change, that's probably what it is. But nonetheless, it, the, the state of the matter is right now that we've yet to definitively prove that knowing that information and acting on it will definitely change our patient outcomes. So to summarize this issue of high on-treatment platelet reactivity, it's clearly a marker of increased ischemic events, particularly in ACS patients. But the question that still needs to be answered is, is it modifiable? Now that we know that, can we do something different that will help our patients? Uh, we know that Prasegrel and Ticagrelor, both of which have lower rates of HPR, they're associated with decreased ischemic events versus clopidogrel, particularly in ACS patients. And as I said, there's no prospective data thus far that says that platelet function test guided therapy will definitely change ischemic events. So as it stands right now, it's, it's a 2B recommendation to utilize platelet function testing. And that's really only, I mean, it's restricted to higher risk patient groups. So this is not something that we at this point need to be doing in all of our patients. And then the last issue I want to bring up based on this last case is the duration of PTY12 blockade. As you know, uh, we started with bare metal stents with a very short duration. We've moved to three months, six months, 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy, and some people even say we need it longer than that. Uh, recently, also at TCT, was an important trial, I think the first of many that we're going to see that's going to ask this question. Perhaps we're treating too long, perhaps at least in some patients, we can shorten the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. Optimized trial run out of uh, South America actually took low-risk patients. I think that's important to remember because we've been emphasizing that they have lower event rates. Took low-risk patients, used the Endeavor DES, not a stent that we use much uh, anymore in uh, this country, but uh, they assigned them to either three months versus 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy, and at least in that group of patients with that stent, they did not see any difference in ischemic events. So I think that's a nice uh, study. We're going to see more like this. They're going to study more relevant clinical scenarios for us, but at least it's an opening volley to say, yeah, we may be able to select certain patients that we can begin to shorten the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. And as uh, Manos referred to, there's going to be multiple studies. The DAP trial uh, will be presented soon, and many others that are going to come out that are going to ask this question in various clinical scenarios. So in, in su summary of the duration of DAPT, the standard of care is still 12 months of DAPT if you implant a DES, and particularly for those with ACS. The guidelines all say that presumes that they have a reasonable risk of bleeding. In other words, if your patients are known to have bleeding, then six months is acceptable in that situation. Uh, probably don't need DAPT beyond 12 months, but the DAPT trial will give us more information about that. Newer generation drug eluting stents, uh, again, Manos was referring to some of the technological advances that are occurring. Newer generations appear to have lower long-term uh, late stent thrombosis events, so that's uh, good news. And again, ACS patients have higher rates of late recurrent events, so if we're thinking about shortening the duration, we want to keep in mind how the patient initially uh, presented. So with that, I will stop. hope that's been an uh, interesting uh, discussion, and we'll have more of that. Uh, to come. Thank you very much for your time.